Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us again today for this uh, Pest Extra live presentation. Uh, today, just before I do some uh, housekeeping, I just want to introduce, we're going to have Alan Buckle today from Crew UK talking about five years of rodenticide stewardship and, you know, what have we achieved? So, yeah, real topic of conversation this year. So pretty excited about that. But just as I said, just before we get started, a bit of housekeeping CPD, hopefully you will understand a bit about CPD now and how it works, but basically activity mean equals CPD points. Um, the more activity you have with us, the more you interact with us, um, talking to exhibitors, talking to going on their stands, having a look at some of their videos, as well as seminars, all of this counts up to your CPD. So the longer you're active with us, the more CPD points that you get, and these will be uploaded for you. Um, so in terms of questions, we have a Q&A section where you can ask the presenter questions about the presentation. Now, they should be able to see a button, the bottom side, maybe top of your screen that says Q&As. Now, again, just use this for Q&As. Any kind of hellos or um, general comments or, or chat that you might want to have, we have a discussion forum. You should be able to see that button there as well. So uh, make sure you don't put your questions to the presenter in the discussion forum bit. Um, put it in the Q&A, but don't worry if you do, we've got a moderator there keeping an eye on you guys and, and helping you out and, and directing you if need be. Uh, if you have any technical or, or sound problems, obviously have a, have a little check of your own uh, internet and just make sure that that's stable. If it continues with any problems, then you've got a, uh, it's an orange button at the top of your screen, which says live support. They'll be able to help you with any technical issues. Um, and then the last thing, we can't see you or hear you. So if you do want to have any live chats, live discussions, then please, you know, visit the relevant, uh, whether it's BPCA stands or the other exhibitors and yeah, have a chat to us, you know, look at our faces, chat face to face. Okay, great. Without further ado, Dr. Alan Buckle, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Natalie. Thanks. Well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining me here on the, um, the lunchtime slot and um, Please, you could be there. I've been sitting looking at this um, this title slide for about five minutes, and there's a worm got into my brain that tells me I've spelled achieved wrong. I, I think it's right, but it, it looks it looks wrong. But anyway, um, what I just wanted to say a couple of introductory things. Um, many of you know that we've been doing the stewardship regime for five years, and at the start, um, the government said that it would review it after five years. And when I agreed to do this slot, I really had thought that that review would be well underway or even perhaps finished by the time we got through to March of 2021. So I thought I might be telling you what the results of the review were. But unfortunately, because of COVID, it was delayed and we're in fact just going into it. So I'm not going to be able to tell you um, much about the outcomes, but I'm going to be able to tell you about things that we are going to be presenting to the government oversight group uh, to tell them what we've achieved. And that's what I'm going to show. So um, what I'm going to do is there's a bit of basic information. If any of you have seen one of my presentations before, you'll, you'll know this, but I can't be sure that everyone has. So there's a bit of basic stuff. And then I'm going to talk principally about the details of the monitoring programs that we've been doing. Um, and it's this monitoring that determines um, how the government assesses the um, achievements and the success and the delivery of stewardship over these five years and basically whether we've done enough to be allowed to keep going or whether we need um, to change some things about the way rodenticides are used in the UK. And there are four of these um, monitoring pro programs specifically. There are many more. I'll show you um, some more, but I'm going to talk about these four um, about barn owl liver residues. And that's, in fact, the single key measure and very important one. Um, in respect of our success in reducing wildlife exposure to second generation anticoagulants. Um, so that's a very important ass assessment process. There's another one about resistance to anticoagulants. The government asks us to give it a report each year about the development spread of resistance. Those, that, Some of you may have seen my resistance talk a couple of days ago. I'm just going to touch on that. Um, I'm not going to go into detail because if you want more detail on resistance, um, I would ask you to go across to that other presentation. Um, we do a project on barn owl breeding. I'll explain why we do that and more about it. And then three, three times through the five years, we've done what's called a CAP survey. Um, this is a survey of knowledge, attitudes and practice among rodenticide users in our three user groups. 
um, farming, gamekeeping and professional pest control. We've done three of those CAP surveys now and we've got lots and lots of data from it and some of it I'll share, I'll share with you. Um, right at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the government oversight and the review and then say something about what, what might happen next. <clears throat> now, I wanted to show you these again. Um, they are really all important. Um, these are the high level principles that the health and safety executive set out at the start of stewardship. And before we begun on stewardship and this, the crew stewardship regime, they essentially set these principles out and said, if you meet these principles, we as government will accept that your regime is um, potentially fit for purpose and we will go ahead and authorize um, rodenticides. And so just quickly to go through these, um, the use of integrated pest management involving a hierarchy of risk controls. Now, many of you will have bumped into this term, the risk hierarchy over the last few years. And I wanted to explain it's that, um, that uh, principle um, that has brought about the requirement for us um, as crew to introduce this concept of, of risk hierarchy and risk controls. Um, they wanna see responsible use of rodenticides when they're needed. Um, and they draw our attention to the potential threat to human animal health and the environments that rodenticides may, may pose. It has to be applicable to all suppliers, all handlers and all professional users. That, that's the whole supply chain. Um, there's a need for the regime to be robust, effective and workable while remaining simple. Um, I'd be very happy to hear your view of, of how simple it is. Um, we do uh, hope that it's been robust and effective at least. Um, not the need for the regime to cover the whole life cycle of the, of the rodenticide um, right from the time the active substance is made all the way through to the time that the products are disposed of if, if they're no longer needed. Um, we enable good practice in the control of rodent po uh, populations as part of integrated pest management and minimizing resistance build up and secondary poisoning of non-target species. So they're um, in the principles they're signaling the really important aspects of resistance and secondary poisoning. And then these are the, the three key benefits uh, governance of the supply chain, a competent workforce, and monitor, a monitoring compliance. It's against those three that the success um, is going to be judged. And at the back end of this, I'll, I'll go through those and I'll see um, how, how we've done. So many of you will have seen this slide, and I put it up, up, up only to emphasize that the whole stewardship regime is, um, is run by these six work groups. Um, they're all populated by, if you like, volunteers from stakeholder organizations from right across the industry, trade associations, as you can see, manufacturers, distributors, and, and that there are dozens and dozens of people working in these um, work groups um, that have day jobs, very busy and very challenging day jobs, but they give their time um, in each of these work groups to make stewardship work. So I put this slide up, I won't go into more detail, um, but just to say thank you to all of those people and um, to recognize the effort that they, that they put in over and above the jobs that they do every day. What you can see also up in the top left there, that's the government oversight group, and that's the group that we, re we report to each year, and that, that is the group that will conduct this major review that's forthcoming in the next couple of months. You can see HSC is the chair, and there are a number of other government agencies um, and also representatives from all of the devolved administrations are in that government oversight group, GOG or GOG as we, as we call it. Now, once again, um, this has got lots of stuff, this slide, and it really is just to give you a view of the whole scope of, of monitoring. And it is so important and Crew has been asked to conduct all of these monitoring processes, and we have achieved all of them um, over the five years. Um, the ones in red are the ones that I'm going to talk about, and these are the main the main ones um, that that are important in monitoring. But there are many other aspects of uh, monitoring um, the stewardship regime. Particularly, you can see some there to do with the uptake of training and the um, the control at point of sale. Um, and we have to make reports and give data on all of those aspects, but um, too much to cover today. I'm just going to do these, these four main ones, but th that's to show the, the, the full scope of monitoring um, in, in stewardship. So the first one I'm going to go to um, of those four is, is this one. It's the one that's um, central to 
showing that we're achieving a reduction in exposure of wildlife. It's an annual study. Um, it's done for us by an independent contractor agency, UKCEH. Um, it's funded by CREW. Every year, um, 100 barn owls, they're found dead, sent in by the public. Um, they're, they're, they're killed by a number of different things. They're autopsied to determine the cause of death. Um, and the liver is taken out and we do liver residue analysis for the concentration of eschars in the tissues. Um, we've got data from um, the years 2007 to 2012. This is before stewardship begun. And each year we look at those 100 barn hours and we compare their liver residues with that baseline. And we um, provide an annual report for the government oversight group. <clears throat> Now, there are three metrics that they look at in these data, and I'll, I'll go through them pretty briefly. Um, they were proposed by um, UKCH and they were accepted by the Government Oversight Group. Um, now, the first is a change in the ratio of birds with detectable residues of flocumafen and diphthylone. That's basically the percentage of birds that carry those two active substances. Now, we do those two active substances separately in this study because in the baseline years, there simply were not enough um, birds that had been carrying residues of those two active substances to compare with present day birds, if you see what I mean. We just didn't have enough baseline data, so we can't do the comparison that we could do for the other three um, second generation anticoagulants. Um, the, main, the main one is changes, or the main two, changing the ratio of owls with high and low concentrations um, of brodifacum, diphenicum and bromodialone. The, the data is split into these two high and low groups um, just because of a statistical requirement that meant we couldn't compare the data sets as a whole and they had to be split up in this way. Um, and specifically looking at changes in the high group and the low group concentrations of those three active ingredients, brodifacum, diphenicum and bromodialone, for which we had good baseline data, and also all of the five summed together. So these are some of the data that we've collected over the, over the years. And you can see the red is the baseline. And um, these are the um, detected percentage of birds carrying residues. Now, the bar in the middle with flocumafen and diphthylone is the important one because this parameter is only used for those two active substances. And I think what you can see there are some pretty clear increases in the, in the percentage of birds that carry those two active substances, particularly for diphthylone. And undoubtedly, as you all know, if you use that substance and how it's come to be used over the last five years, that's almost certainly um, because of the fact that diphthylone is being used more and more in the UK as its market presence um, is increased. And so that means that we're starting to find it more and more in, in barn owls. Um, if you look down at the bottom, um, with um, the percentage detected with any um, SCAR, we're, we're up over 80%, but there's no consistent increase in that percentage, um, nor is there really a, a, an increase for the, for the birds that have more than one, that's the multiple residue bar. So these, these are the important data, and you can see on the left there, the data for the low concentration group and for the high concentration group. And these are shown in these, what they call bar and whisker charts. And really all you need to look at is the line that sits in the middle of the boxes. Um, that's the mean, the mean level of the low residues and the high residues. And I think what you can see it wouldn't surprise you to hear that when we do statistical analysis of these data, we do not find any differences between the mean residues, high or low, with baseline. And so what that says is that we have not successfully reduced the exposure of UK barn owls to second generation anticoagulants through the stewardship regime. So that's a pretty important and disappointing finding. The key point, though, is that um, although we started the um, regime in 2016, um, all of its elements were really not in place until 2018. And the last birds we looked at were in 2019, found dead in 2019, and would have picked up those residues in 2018. 
which was the first year when all of the provisions of the Shushit regime were in place. So what we're trying to say to the government oversight group is give us some more time. We really haven't had enough time with such a complex biological mechanism to affect this complex mechanism um, in the time that we've had available. So no important statistical differences. Stewardship's not reduced exposure, but neither has the outdoor use of the most potent SCARs increased exposure. Now, you're, I'm sure you're aware that when we started stewardship for the first time, uh, the three most potent substances, um, rodifacinflocoop and difathylam, were used for the first time outdoors. And everyone was very concerned that that would cause significant um, wildlife impact. Um, and that hasn't happened. So if stewardship has achieved something, that what we've done is to manage the outdoor use of those more potent um, SCARs. Um, stewardship was fully implemented as I said in 2018, and we just haven't had enough time. And a key point is that over those five years, five years times 100 hours, 500 hours, only one of those hours was found at autopsy, possibly to have been killed by SCARs. So that's quite an important um, thing to keep in mind. Um, the remainder killed in traffic collisions and by starvation. So to move on to resistance, and um, this, the study is done at the University of Reading. It's funded, was funded by the Resistance Action Committee, the International Committee. It's now funded by CREW. We take um, mouse tail tips, and thank you very much for all of you who have sent these um, samples. We need loads more, so please keep sending them. Um, we do resistance maps. All the data is provided to the Resistance Action Committee for a resistance mapping tool, which I'll show you later. And there's an annual report for the Government Oversight Group. So um, I would ask you to go and have a look at the other resistance presentation that I gave on Tuesday, uh, much more information there, but I'm just gonna show a couple of graphics here. Um, this is the graphic that shows all of the resistance um, and all of the tails that we've ever DNA analyzed. So it's got the whole picture with 531 rat tail tips. The UK has more mutations than any other country worldwide. Um, we've got five important mutations, no one else has five, um, but we do more resistance testing than, uh, than anywhere else. Um, you can see southern in, uh, England is heavily resistant, and, and, but it is much sampled. We can't really say if the picture is different elsewhere because, as you can see from the scarcity of those little spots, um, we really don't have as much data as we would like from further up um, in other parts of the country. Um, it's heavily sampled down in the south, merely because we go out from the University of Reading and trap rats, um, and we, we, we take those rats back. And so we got lots more from that process. Um, the resistance um, data is, is, is patchy. You can see a large area in the central Midlands, um, hopefully you can, you can see this, um, where we have very, very few samples, but those samples we do have um, show that there is um, not much resistance in the Midlands and we really need some more samples from those mid Midland counties. Um, finally, a very new finding um, just this year is we're starting to find hybrid resistance, that is um, animals that carry more than one resistance mutation. The colours on the graph, um, each colour is a different mutation and so there are five different colours there. Um, and what's happening, we think, is that these foci that were once discrete foci, and you can imagine down there in, um, in East Sussex, on the border of East Sussex and, um, and, and West Sussex, the, the red squares, which is a, a mutation called L120Q, are meeting the blue squares, which is a mutation called Y139F. And when they meet, uh, it's possible that two rats, each having a different mutation breed and their offspring then carry two mutations. And for the first time in the latest data from last year, we've, we've found eight rats from actually from really all over the country um, showing these double mutations. We, we really just don't know yet what that means. So this is the mouse map, um, very many fewer samples um, for, for, for mice, but the bottom line is we've had um, 93 samples and 93.5% of those samples that have come in are, are resistant. Um, there are two mutations, Y139C and L128S, and you can see the red is, is Y139C. It's mainly in the south and east, um, but L128S is pretty much spread all over the place. There's some hybrid resistance, that's the, the orange colors that you can see. 
Um, from the dispersal of resistant mice samples that we've got, we believe it's reasonable to assume that all mouse infestations carry resistant individuals across the UK um, and from the percentage of resistance that we've got. So it, it's pretty safe to assume that um, any mouse infestation that you're um, controlling um, contains um, anticoagulant resistant mice. So I tell, I tell you a little bit about this. Um, if those of you, um, if, if some of you ha haven't tried it, um, all of those data points all go into an interactive map that sits on that website that you can see at the top. Um, you can dial in um, as you please. If you want to see resistance or resistance and susceptible rats, you can dial in the strains that you're interested to know about. You can home in on a point where you might be working and you can tell the program how far away from there you need to you want to go in your search for resistance so that you can find where the nearest resistance to you is and what that resistance mutation is and you can find out elsewhere on the site what, what to do about the specific mutation so you can see I've honed in somewhere there pretty much just north of Derby home of BPCA um, and you can see what it tells me um, there are 20 susceptible records within 93 kilometers there are 26 records of resistance there are one, two, three different strains. Um, and so this is a very useful and hopefully helpful um, resistance tool for you to find out what's going on with both rats and mice in your, in your area. The problem is we've still got lots of gaps and we still need lots more information. So I'm going to move to the third one. Um, this, is, this is the only one that in fact um, crew was not asked to do by the health and safety executive and the government oversight group. This is something that we decided to do ourselves. Since the barn owl was the key sentinel species for barn owl residues or for liver residues, we decided that we'd keep an eye on how it was how it was breeding in the UK. And you can see there the red dots are the places where in one year, I think 2019, all of the CEH barn owl liver residues came from. So that's the hundred birds and the little coloured squares are quadrats in which we look at barn owl breeding. Um, so really what we're trying to do is to find out how the barn owls are breeding while they're carrying residues of um, scars. Now that link is disputed by the government scientists on the government oversight group. Um, we would argue that if 80 or 90 percent of barn owls carry residues, then there's a very good likelihood that those sitting in our little quadrats there carry those residues. But because we don't actually look at the residues in the barn owls we study, um, we haven't persuaded the government scientists that that's, um, that's a, a good jump to make. But um, we believe it's, it's a reasonable assumption. So these are the sort of data that, uh, that we get, and I, I'm not going to go into this very much at all. Um, but what you can see is some dramatic fluctuations year to year on the productivity of barn owls. Um, it's all to do with climate and it's all to do with prey availability. Those are two main variables. But you can see if you look at 2013-2014, um, 2013, 2014, um, 2013 was, an, was an awful year um, with very few um, nestlings found, um, whereas 2014 was, a, was a, 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 a very good year. Along, along the bottom um, is the total number of barn owl chicks ringed by British Trust for Ornithology volunteers. So that's the minimum number of new barn owls that flew away into the UK population. Um, and it, it mirrors very well um, the productivity of the nest that we closely monitor in this particular study. So I'm going to now talk to you about the, the, the CAP study. Um, it's run by an independent market research company. Um, we did it once in 2015 before stewardship and we've repeated it twice since. Um, finally, we did one last year. Um, in the one last year, we spoke to 150 pest controllers, 93 gamekeepers and 350 farmers. It's a, it's a phone or an online qu questionnaire. We have to keep in mind it tells us what people say they do. It doesn't tell us necessarily what people actually do. But what it shows is, is significant, I would say huge improvements in all aspects of roaming control across all user groups, some more than others, but certainly huge changes. And what I believe it shows is the 
uh, is the profound changes that stewardship has brought about in the way we use rodenticides in the UK, uh, well, professional rodenticides uh, across the whole country. Um, we don't publish the results. We have a huge amount of information. Um, we show some results as I'm going to, um, but we don't want people when they get this phone call to actually know what the questions are and know what the right answers are. So we, we rather keep this under wraps. But just quickly, some of them, so, um, some of the things that we've got coming out of this. Um, so here there's a question, um, do you have qualifications? And you can see for farmers, gamekeepers and PCOs, not much change for PCOs because you are all highly qualified mob in the first place. But for the other user groups, farmers and gamekeepers, you can see quite big um, increases in the number of formal rodenticide qualifications they, they've got. Um, here, which of you are in um, CPD schemes? And you can see again, increases right across the board. And once again, um, professional pest control leads the way, of course. Um, here is a question about um, what was the latest or the last brand that you used? And these are the people that knew the brand and the people that didn't know the brand. Um, and you can see very big differences in gamekeeping. You can see quite big differences in PCO. Um, obviously, knowing what brand you use is, is important um, because that might help you know what active substance is there. And it's very important in resistance management and also in um, the uh, risk hierarchy and, and so on. And so without that information, um, you're more or less doing rodent control blind. And we want to see more and more people um, answer that question. Um, and this is a similar question. Um, by the way, did you know what the active, active ingredient is if you knew the brand? Um, and you can see positive changes um, across all the farming groups, although quite low base, um, good um, progress with um, gamekeepers, obviously very good results in um, all of you folks seem to know what active substance you're, you're using. Are there any situations using where you employ permanent baiting? Um, and I, I know many of you will know that we suspect that permanent baiting may be one of the causes of wildlife exposure. And you can see there over, all of these user groups, um, the orange bar for 2020 is much smaller than all of the other bars. And so that again shows, I believe, what, um, what we're helping to achieve. Um, some things aren't changing. And this is a question about how concerned are you, um, you're dealing with resistant rat populations. And what it says is mostly about 50% are either not very or not at all um, concerned. Now, it's a bit of an ambiguous question. And when we look at the results, we don't really know if people are not concerned because they, they know jolly well how they're handling resistance. And so they believe they're competent to handle resistance or they're, it may be that they're not concerned because they just don't know about it. So um, it, 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 it isn't a very clear answer, but certainly things are not much changing. Um, so yeah, that's that's the the, the, the fourth of those, of those um, monitoring st studies that I was going to tell you about. So I'm just now going to say a little bit um, towards the end about the major review. Um, um, who's doing it, what's going to be done, um, and what the timing, timing is now. Um, each year, CREW has submit, submitted an annual report um, to the Government Oversight Group and attends a, in, attends a meeting with it. And after each of these meetings and each of these reports, the Government itself re um, produces a report we, we put up that report um, in about November, December, at the end of the year, and in about um, February, March, um, they, they, they respond in, in a formal way with their own report. These reports can all be found, found online. Um, but after each meeting, the Government Oversight Group has, has, has said, in conclusion, government is content that the rodenticide regime is fit for purpose and meets the principles and requirements set out in paragraph eight, which was the high level principles that I have showed you before, uh, with the caveats provided regarding further work planned. So there are always um, some things that we can improve upon, but in general, the government right through stewardship has, has had the view it's fit for purpose. At the start of, a, uh, of stewardship, HSC said it would review after five years, that's 2020, it was delayed. Um, we, I've just spent literally the last um, three weeks sitting in front of the computer compiling this five-year report 
Um, it's gone for layout and it should be completed by the end of February and the deadline is to send it to the government oversight group um, by the first week of March. Um, the government oversight group will then conduct a, an, an e-review by email of that report in April. Um, and in other words, they'll, they'll work out what their thoughts are um, and then in May there'll be a meeting with crew and we'll meet the government oversight group. Um, the question is, um, will the government oversight group review scope? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. I, I put this there because I know it's a question that many of you put to me. Um, why is it that um, consumer products or general public products are not part of the stewardship regime? This was a decision made right at the start and you can go back to the start and see um, the reasons why HSC decided that that was not the case. So um, what have we achieved? Now, down the, down the left side there, I've got these um, three HSC declared key benefits, government uh, governance of the, over, of, of the supply chain, competent workforce and monitoring compliance. Um, and I, I just put a few, there are, there are many more, but I, I put a few of the things that have been done against these. So now all professional road inside sales are audited by a basis so that we know everyone is proving competence when they, bu when they buy them. And we know that 93% of sales are compliant. That does mean that 7% um, um, are not, and that's a bit more work that we need to do. Um, we have um, a website where people, if they see things going wrong, either online or in store, they can uh, formally complain um, anonymously to crew and we investigate that. So we believe, and we've ticked the box of, of um, governments of, of the supply chain. Now, um, the work that we've done throughout stewardship has been very much to promote a competent workforce. So we've got proof of competence at the point of sale. Um, we've got um, very big uptake of training across all user sectors. Um, best practice documents are published and publicized, and you all know about them, where to find them. All aspects of the CAP show improvement um, in the competence of the people that use Rodenticides. We are getting out more resistance information. We need more, but this does um, um, help a competent workforce to improve its management. We've moved on the risk hierarchy and got that introduced. Um, we've got people, we, we hope, uh, thinking about it and using it. Um, environmental risk assessments have, have come along. We've given guidance on, on that. And you'll find um, all of the products now have improved label statements to help you use them effectively and safely. And there's those famous statements that require you to follow um, crew guidance or other guidance that is equivalent. So with monitoring compliance, um, we've met all of the monitoring requirements. We've delivered all of the programs. The cross in the box is we haven't managed to reduce Barnell liveries use as yet. And I've explained why I'm hoping we're gonna get some more um, time to deliver that. So what, what now? Um, the government oversight group said these things and I'm gonna read them, I'm afraid. Um, the outputs from the monitoring will not be used as hard triggers. In other words, there's no one aspect of monitoring which say that we pass or fail, but the performance measures will be discussed that are discussed below in, in, in the document, along with other information from elements of the monitoring program uh, e.g. the CAT survey to form a judgment as to how stewardship regime is progressing and whether any changes are required. Depending on the outcome of the above, changes could range from minor modifications of the stewardship regime, um, changes to the approved uses, amendment to approval of specific products or revocation of uses or products. So basically, um, they're going to look at what we've done, see if we've achieved enough, suggest perhaps how things might be improved um, and possibly make some changes. So the government will decide what it wants to do and it will probably make those decisions in the summer. Crew's position that insufficient time has elapsed with all students, uh, all, all elements of stewardship in place and to ask for more time, particularly for that barn our liver residue. Um, and the, the report that we have submitted to the government oversight group will be published and go on to, um, into the public domain in, in the summer. So you'll all be able to, say, to see what we've said. And I, that's the end of the presentation. And I think I've got a bit of time left to take some questions. Yeah, I've just had to unmute myself. Sorry, I talked to myself there, Alan. <laughs> um, great.
Great, fabulous. That was fantastic. Um, so yeah, questions. We have got some lots of votes going on for people's favourite questions. And the top one is, what is your view of cilantro? Or polycalciferol, uh, <laughs> we say, rather than... Um, well, um, for, formally for crew, um, we're, we're still, we're looking at it. It's, it, it's, a, it, it's a complex thing. Um, there are lots of pros and cons for all of the active substances and, and there some have risks in one area and others have risks in other areas. So we are at this very moment um, preparing a new code of best practice um, that, will, that will publish what we think about cholecalciferol and how it fits into how people might do rodent pest management in the future. Um, but it is under consideration. Um, so that's pretty much all I think I want to say at, at, at the moment. But the new code of best practice is due to be out within the next couple of months. So it's going to be resolved very Absolutely. quickly. In speech, so I think it's them speaking to their suppliers and the distributors to get what their view is and what feedback they're getting. It's, it's a good idea as well, I think, with that, isn't it? Um, just, just a quick yeah. comment to the attendees. I, there's some questions coming up about environmental risk assessments and tail samples, but just we put some information in the discussion forum just so that people can have a look at that. I didn't want to spend your time on that, Alan, but uh, just for the attendees, it's in the okay, discussion but, forum. Can yeah. I just say quickly, um, those of you who didn't go to the resistance talk on Tuesday, um, Crew now has a new process where you can go on the Crew website, ask for um, a postage kit. Um, and that this will come to you. It's not postage page, unfortunately, but the, the kit comes to you. It's got an envelope um, addressed. It's got all of the um, other uh, plastic bags that you need to send your tails. So if you if you want one of those, just go online. One will come to you in the post, and we we hope you can get us lots more tail yeah, samples. We need to push that, don't we? We do need a lot more. Um, I'm always talking to it about people. Come on, get them in, get them in. Um, fabulous. Well, I've got a few minutes left. So, in relation to secondary poisoning and bioaccumulation, do you have any data on how much active ingredient remains in a rat or a mouse carcass? Yes, well, there, there, there is quite a lot out there. Um, and so there are people that have, have scooped up dead rats and squashed them through a mincer. It, I've, I've done that job myself. It's not a nice one. Um, so you get whole body residues. Okay. Um, some people would bail out of that and just use liver residues, but the, obviously the liver isn't the only thing that carries these, these anticoagulants. And so um, they, 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 they do remain. What we've also done is we've um, tracked rats on treated farms over a period of time. So we know that um, those residues stay in, in live rats for some time. Um, it, it, if, if I give a milligram per kilogram um, amount, it's somewhere between sometimes one and sometimes up to five milligrams per kilogram. So a dead rat is, if you've got a 50 milligram per kilogram bait, weight for weight a dead rat can be about um, one, um, one fiftieth, um, or one tenth as poisonous as the bait is mm -hmm. itself. Um, it depends on the substance and it depends how long after the rat's eaten the bait um, as well, because it does go out of that carcass, um, the, uh, the live rats. Obviously in carcasses, it doesn't change. Um, and it's, it's often in that range, um, one to five milligrams per kilogram. Divide by five if you want to find out how much per rat if it's a 20 gram rat. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and the second part of that question, does the active stay in the system of the non-targets poisoned by secondary poisoning long term or is it secreted from the animal? It's slow. It's slowly secreted. These these things are. Um, well, the, uh, the word is 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 lipophilic. They, they like to stick to fats. And once they've stuck to a fat, um, the body has difficulty to part um, the fat from the active substance. Um, and it happens only very slowly. Um, it, it does happen. So um, slowly um, it's cleared, but um, it takes mm. quite a long time, a matter of, of sometimes um, 100 days to, to um, get rid of just half of the active mm -hmm. substance. Fantastic. Yeah, some detailed questions and answers here. It's, it's fantastic. Um, Orlando, so please could you let me know how to obtain the pack for sending our tail samples? Right, I didn't do it. So, that's, so that information is in this discussion forum. So if you're happy for us to 
state that Alan for them to go and have yep. a look at it. Yes, Great. Very good. Um, so uh, a bit of a statement and then a question. So um, I've been a fan of rodenticide reduction way before crew was even thought about. We have been proofing out problems, reducing food and harborage, etc. Question is, long term, just how big will the rodent problem become by not actually reducing rodents? And has there been any thought in feeding rodents with a birth control and naturally non-toxically reduce rodents? Um, well, that's a very, a very, I, I, I hate it when people say that's a good question because, because you wouldn't no. ask it if it's not a good question, but it is a good, it is a good question. But um, it, it's a difficult one to answer. Um, what happens if you proof animals out is you're, you're, you're stopping them getting to the food they want to get to. So you're basically reducing the carrying capacity in the first place. So just be, just because you're not killing them, if you stop them get to food, um, there is a chance that populations will decrease because they're then dependent on the natural foraging that they can do rather than the food that we provide them. So that, that's one thing to say. But um, certainly if we're not killing rats, they're breeding. And so that, that is um, an issue to, to consider. Um, the, the question, um, this is a bit like a, 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 a question to Matt, to Matt Hancock. He usually manages to, to write down the three or four parts of the question. But I think that the, the last part was about um, the um, biocontrol um, using reproduction controls. There's quite a lot of work going on reproductive controls for many mammal species. Um, in this country, I know that they're working on, on it for some of the larger mammals like, like wild pig and, and so on. Um, there is at least one substance that is approved, I believe, in the US that claims to control the breeding of, of rats. So it may be that those sorts of substances will uh, become more important um, and um, might come here. But at the moment, um, we don't have any authorised for, for that use. Um, there are all sorts of issues with controlling or, or, or using chemicals to control rodent breeding. Um, and I, I, I Environmental won't conditions, I'd imagine, are very important to be able to sustain it and make it effective. And... Well, it's also some. Um, it, it's if you're con if if you're controlling the reproduction of both sexes mm. or just one sex. Some of these go for just males, which means just you have to just have one. You miss one male, and that male gets mm. around quite a lot. And all of a sudden, you've got lots of pregnant females. So there, there, there are lots of questions over these mm. substances. But certainly, there's one. If you go online, you can see one in 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 the US. Great stuff. We find you one more just before our time runs out. So um, yep. okay, let me have a look. So, is there any data available for Northern Ireland? Um, no, there's very little data available for Northern Ireland in pretty much every aspect of this. Um, we, we've, we, we would like tales from Northern Ireland, um, but we haven't had any. Um, they have done a resistance study in, um, in the Republic, um, and they found no resistant rats there at all. Out of, they found about 50 rats um, from the East Coast and astonishingly no resistance. So that's the sort of situation we would expect was happening in Northern Ireland, but we can't be sure until we get some tails. Um, we, we don't collect barn owls from there because, well, I, I, I don't know why it, it, it doesn't go into the predatory bird monitoring scheme from, mm. from, from Ireland. So from, from Northern Ireland. So we are short of data from there. And if there are people um, that are there listening to this, um, we'd be very keen to hear from them in all Just of these aspects. Myself, so, uh you know encourage that uh, involvement so yeah northern ireland fantastic yeah great well i think that brings us into our session alan thank you again um so much for thank for you. that yeah lots of uh, detailed information there thank you um and, and have a great day and to the attendees um just a, a little reminder have a look around the exhibitors stands make sure that you get involved with what we're doing and um, yeah again have a wonderful day and we we'll hope to see you soon thank you and it's goodbye Thanks, from alan. me <laughs> Okay, cheers.